Are you happy to be at church today? It's a good day in the house of the Lord. Turn to your neighbor, turn to your neighbor and let them know that, hey, you're, you're glad that this is not a perfect church. Go ahead, tell them. I'm glad it's not a perfect church. Turn to your other neighbor. Tell them, if it was, I wouldn't be here. I'm so uh, thankful for Pastor Owen and Sarah and their leadership. It's an honor to be able to fill in the pulpit for him uh, this morning. I was, um, you know, Paul and I, we both have uh, four kids, so we were kind of giving him a hard time this week about what's it like having number three. And I'll be honest with you, the transition from number three to number four, for us, this is me and Jen's experience, it was way easier than that transition from number two to number three. That transition from two to three, it's when I lost my hair. I promise you, that's when it started falling out. That was stressful. We were outnumbered, diapers everywhere, and bottles everywhere. We didn't know what was going on. But once we had number four, it got a lot easier. So I was telling Owen, if you have three, you might as well go ahead and have number four. I don't know if they're gonna do that or not, but. Well, I'm excited to share this morning's message. We're right in a series entitled, It's Not Over yet, it's not over yet. And this is, this is a series about, it's about hope. The hope that we have in Jesus. The hope that we have because Jesus is the one who went to the cross. He's the one who accomplished everything on our behalf so that we can stand here this morning and we can worship and we can give God honor and we can stand in freedom and rejoice because of the goodness and the mercy of God in our lives. So I'm excited to share this morning's message. I wanna open up with a quick word of prayer and then we'll get right into uh, the word. So Father, we love you. God, we love you. We thank you, we praise you, we give you honor, we give you glory. And I ask this morning, oh God, that there would be a, a burning in all of our hearts and every man, every woman, every uh, person, whether young, whether old, whoever they are, God, I pray there's a burning desire in their heart to hear your word, to hear from you. Not to hear a person, God, but to hear your voice. Holy Spirit, will you speak? Give me your anointing, oh God, to preach the word this morning. God, may there be a, a deep conviction. May it go forth with power and under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. And God, we just give you honor and we give you glory. We magnify you. Be exalted, oh God. Be exalted in this house today. We love you and we praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, the strong son of God, and everybody said amen. amen and amen. Well, I have a question for you this morning, and I pray that by the end of this message, you'll be able to answer this with confidence and without any wavering. And my question to you is, where do you hope to find hope? When you're in a moment of weakness, when you're empty, when you're lonely, when you're frustrated, when you're broken, when you're disappointed, when you've reached the end of yourself, where then do you turn? Where do you hope to find hope? I think there's a lot of different places that people turn to, and I think if we were to take the many and put them under simple categories, uh, I would just present four different areas people hope to find hope. One would be people people and the relationships that they have or in the relationships that they desire to have. If, if I had that person or if I was with this person, the hope that I'm longing for would be met. Another area people look to is the area of, of power. You know, simply that, that sense of I'm in control. I have the authority I'm in the decision-making seat. And really, it's gratifying the pride of life. Other people, they look to possessions, don't they? The accumulation of wealth, the accumulation of material gain, gratifying the lust of the eyes. Another place would be pleasures. The indulging in physical pleasures, the gratifying of the lust of the flesh. And I don't know about you, but in my life, in my experience, I've, I've learned pretty quickly that people, people will let you down. 
Power will sabotage you. Possessions will be lost and pleasures will leave you empty. Just reminds me of what the author of Hebrews says, that the pleasures of sin will last for a season. And I'm not saying that all people and all power and all possessions and all pleasures are are necessarily sinful, but I, I can assure you of this, if that's where you're looking, if that's where you hope to find hope, then you will always come up empty. You will always come up short because we do not find our hope in the things of this world. We do not find our hope in the things of this world. Where do you hope to find hope? I wanna read to you a passage of scripture, Hebrews chapter six. This is Hebrews 6, 13 through 18. And I believe it shows us where we can really find hope. It says, when God made his promise to Abraham. So let me just pause right there because this redirects us to Genesis chapter 15. And Genesis chapter 15 Abraham gets to a point in his life, God had already given him the promise of a son, that he would be a father of many nations. And he gets to this point in his life, it's several years after that, about 10 years after the initial promise. And Abraham's looking around and Abraham's saying, I don't have a son, what's going on? And he kind of expresses this frustration to God. I don't know if you've ever been there, but God's like, what's going on? You've made me this promise and I don't see it coming to pass just yet. And so God reassures Abraham in the promise that he made. He reassures him in the covenant that God had made with Abraham. And in this particular instance, not only does God give Abraham a promise, but then God confirms that promise with an oath. So in Genesis chapter 15, this is what God does. God says, Abraham, I want you to bring me a heifer, I want you to bring me a goat, and I want you to bring me a ram. And I want you to sacrifice these animals. So Abraham does just that. He brings these animals, he sacrifices them on the altar. Then it says that Abraham went into a deep sleep. And in this deep sleep, God speaks to him, kind of reaffirms the promise. When Abraham wakes up, the, the, the sacrifice is being consumed By God, fire from heaven is consuming the sacrifice that Abraham made. So this was God's promise that was given to Abraham and then God confirms it with the oath in consuming the sacrifice. So here's what the author of Hebrews says. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting Patiently, or not so patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. It's like when you get married, you stand at the altar, you exchange your vows, you make the promise, but then you confirm it with an oath. You give a seal of, 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 of not, not necessarily approval, but the seal of this is, this is my oath to you that I'm gonna, every promise that I made, every vow that I made, I'm gonna do my best to, to bring up my end, to love you and to cherish you, to pursue you, to, to, to love you as Christ has loved me. And so this is what's happening. The promise was given and the oath was given as well. And then this is what it says. God did this so that by two unchangeable things. What are the two unchangeable things? The first one is the promise. Abraham, you'll have a son. You'll be a father of many nations. The second thing is the oath. He consumed the, the, uh, the, the sacrifice on the altar, those are the two unchangeable things. And then the author of Hebrews says, oh, by the way, God doesn't lie. So he does two unchangeable things. He makes the promise, he gives the oath. God, it's impossible for God to lie. And then it says, we, this is speaking to you and I, who have fled to take hold of the hope. What have we fled? 
As believers and followers of Jesus, what have we fled? We have fled the pursuit of the things of this world, expecting the things of this world to give us what we truly need. That's what we have fled. We have fled the, the, the pride of life, the, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. We run from those things and we take hold of what? We take hold of the hope set before us so that we may be greatly encouraged. And then the author says this, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Church, I want you to know this morning, where do you hope to find your hope? Our only hope is Jesus. Listen, God made a promise, did he not? Whosoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but will have everlasting life. God made an oath, did he not? It was Jesus on the cross, it was his broken body, it was his shed blood that confirmed the promise of heaven in our lives. So Jesus is both the promise and Jesus is both the oath. Therefore, where do we hope to find hope? I want you to know if it's anywhere other than Jesus, we will always come up short. But if we hope to find hope with Jesus, at the feet of Jesus, we will discover it's not over yet. I believe hope is found at the feet of Jesus. That's the title of my message this morning. Hope is found at the feet of Jesus. Hope is restored at the feet of Jesus. Hope is renewed at the feet of Jesus. And there's this remarkable woman in scripture that just embodies beautifully what it means to find hope at the feet of Jesus. And we're gonna look at Mary of Bethany this morning. Mary of Bethany. There's several different Marys mentioned in the New Testament. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus. There's Mary Magdalene, the follower of Jesus. And then there's Mary of Bethany the sister of Lazarus, the sister of Martha. And every time, there's three instances in the New Testament where we, we read about Mary of Bethany. And every single time we read about Mary of Bethany, guess where she's at? She's at the feet of Jesus every single time. So I believe there is a lot that we can gain from looking at her story in scripture. So let's first go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, this is the first time we meet Mary, uh, Martha and Lazarus as well. And it says, as Jesus, this is verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So the very first time we're introduced to Mary of Bethany, she's already at the feet of Jesus. And did you, did you pay attention to what she was doing? She wasn't just sitting there uh, uh, disinterested. She was sitting there listening to every word that he said. Verse 40, it says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Does anybody identify with Martha? I mean, I think Martha, we give Martha a hard times uh, sometimes, don't we? Like if I was Martha and flesh and blood Jesus showed up to my house, I would be pretty busy too. Like every one of my kids would have a broom in one hand, a mop in the other hand, a duster in their mouth, clean the house. You know you're gonna dust off that fan that's never been dusted. You're gonna wipe down the baseboards that you haven't wiped down. Your anxiety is probably rising right now just thinking about all the stuff you have to do if somebody comes over to your house and visits you. We give Martha a hard time. We would all be Martha in this situation. We would all want a clean house. If flesh and blood Jesus showed up, you would want a clean house, you would want a nice meal, you would want it to be presentable if flesh and blood Jesus showed up. It says Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. In fact, only one 
Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Martha was busy, but do you know what? None of that was wrong. In her, in her efforts to want a clean house and a, and a nice meal, that wasn't wrong. That, that wasn't why Jesus rebuked uh, Martha. He rebuked Martha not because of the action, but because of the distraction. He did not rebuke her because she was busy. He rebuked her because in her busyness, she missed out on that which was better. And I think this is, this is the hurdle that we face as humanity in our pursuit of hope. You see, we turn to people, we turn to power, we turn to pleasures, we turn to uh, possessions, hoping, just hoping to find hope. But at best, at best, they're just distractions in our life, taking us away from that which is better. And at the very worst, they're deceptions that can very easily and quickly lead to our destruction. Martha wasn't doing anything bad. She just was missing out on that which was best. And the good thing became a distraction from the best thing. And Mary, choosing to sit at the feet of Jesus, she chose the best thing. Sitting at his feet, listening to every word that he spoke. And Jesus said, this will not be taken from her. She found hope. She found hope that is an anchor for the soul. She found hope that is firm and secure, something that cannot be taken away from her by anything in this world. She found hope at the feet of Jesus and listened to every word that he said. It reminds me of something that, that Peter said to Jesus it was in John chapter six and Jesus gave a really hard teaching. It was about uh, his, his body and his blood and uh, the people there who were listening. He had a lot of followers at this point in time. And it said a lot of people left. They looked at Jesus and they were like, Jesus, this is too hard. This is too hard, we're out of here. And they go on. And Jesus turns to his disciples, those closest to him. And he said, are you gonna leave me too? Are you gonna walk away as well? And Peter looks at Jesus and said, Jesus, where else are we gonna go? Where else are we gonna go? He said, only you have the words of eternal life. Amen. So we sit at the feet of Jesus, but we listen to his words because in his words, we find not just hope, but eternal life. And eternal life isn't something that's saved for the afterlife. Eternal life is here. Eternal life is now. It's Christ in you. It's Christ in you. And I just think about, you know, this is me talking now, but I, I love, I'm a words of affirmation guy. Like, I love compliments. I love it when my wife says, I love you, honey, you're amazing. I love it when my kids say, you're the best daddy ever. Uh, I love it when, uh, but the church family, you guys are like the best. Every single Sunday, you guys come up. I know it's not just me, all right? I know it's not just me, but you guys come up and we love you, pastor. We're praying for you, pastor. We appreciate you. I love that. That makes me feel like a million bucks inside. But can I tell you something? Those are not the words of eternal life. Those are not the words of eternal life. I don't have the words of eternal life. Whatever sense of power and control I think I might have cannot give me the words of eternal life. I could gain the whole world, but I would not have in my possession the words of eternal life. I can indulge in all the pleasures this world has to offer, and I would never hear once the words of eternal life. Only Jesus has the words of eternal life. And when we sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to every word that comes out of his mouth, we find hope. C.S. Lewis said it like this, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. If we hope to find hope in the things of this world, we'll miss out on the hope that only heaven can provide. Where do you hope to find hope? Where do you hope to find hope? We read again about Mary in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11. And we find out quickly that Lazarus 
the brother of Mary and Martha, is dead. So if Luke 10 is a picture of the good times, then John 11 is a picture of the bad times, the hard times, the difficult seasons of life. So where do we hope to find hope when times are difficult? So Jesus arrives there at Mary and Martha's house and Lazarus was already dead. Jesus heard the news that he was sick, he delayed. By the time he got to Lazarus, he had already passed away. And so Martha runs to Jesus and Jesus has this exchange with Martha where he reminds Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Even if he's dead, he's not really dead. And he, he asks Martha that really tough question, do you believe? Do you believe? And so Martha then leaves Jesus there, runs back to the house, and this is where we pick up the conversation she has with Mary. Verse 28, John 11, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, what did she do? She fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So in the good times, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and listened. Now, in the difficult times, what do we see Mary doing? Now she's running to Jesus. She's falling at his feet, and she's crying out to him. So in the good times, Mary was at the feet of Jesus. In the bad times, Mary was at the feet of Jesus. And it reminds me, it reminds me of Rahab in the Old Testament. If you remember the story of Rahab, uh, this was... Uh, after Moses had died and Joshua was now leading the children of Israel, and Joshua led them across the Jordan River into the Promised Land, uh, Jericho was in front of them. They were waiting for the instructions from the Lord on what to do. And while they were waiting, Joshua sent in uh, a few spies into Jericho just to spy out the land. Jericho was a well-fortified city. It had a wall that went all around. And so the spies get into the city, they're found out, they end up in the house of Rahab, and Rahab hides them, keeps them safe. Once the coast is clear, Rahab uh, helps them escape. But as they're leaving, she says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know who you are, and I know the God that you serve, and I know what's about to happen. She said, make me a promise. When you come into this city, spare me, spare my family. And the two spies gave her a scarlet cord and said, as long as this scarlet cord, which by the way, that scarlet cord is a type and shadow of Jesus himself on that cross. As long as this scarlet cord is hanging out of your window, which her apartment was built into the wall. So she lived in the wall of the city. So as long as this scarlet cord is hanging out of your window, you and your family will be safe. And I just want you to, I want you to use your imagination for just a few moments. The children of Israel come to Jericho and they march around that city for, for six days, one time a day. And on that seventh day, they march around and march around and march around and they get around that city, those city walls one last time and they give that shout, the trumpets blow. There is Rahab in her uh, apartment there built into the wall of the city. And when that shout goes up and those trumpets are blasted, all of a sudden she can begin to hear the cracks in the wall. She can feel the rumble of that city. And the only thing she has in that moment is the promise and to hang on to that scarlet cord. And somebody in here today, you feel like your world is falling down. You feel like the world is falling apart. As the church, we can hear the cracks. We can feel the rumble all around us. We have a promise and we have a hope. All we got to do, find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Where do you hope 
Define hope. Where do you hope? Define hope. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. We have a hope that is an anchor for our soul. It is firm. It is secure. Church, we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Jesus has us in the very palm of his hands. And I pray that as a church, when society around us is cracking and crumbling and we can feel the earth rumbling and shaking because the Bible says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken in those moments, in those seasons, whether they're difficult, whether they're hard, whatever it may be, that we can respond like Mary and run to the feet of Jesus and fall down at his feet and cry out to him that we can respond like Rahab, holding on to the promise, believing it's not over, yet hanging on to the one who holds us firm and secure in his grip. This is a challenge. There's a tension, right? Because here I am talking about Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, running to the feet of Jesus. But Mary had flesh and blood Jesus, did she not? And we're all in here like, well, if I had flesh and blood Jesus, I would do the same thing. I would run to him, I'd hang on, I'd cling to his robe, I'd do everything that she's doing. Maybe, maybe. In every story, she's the only one at his feet, so that says a lot. But that's the tension, right? Like, it's easy to say, well, of course I'll sit at his feet if he's right here in front of me. But what does it mean for us here in the 21st century? I just want to remind you what Paul said. It's, it's Christ in us. That's the hope of glory. It's not Christ in front of us, behind us, beside us. It's Christ in us. That's the hope of glory. What did Jesus say? He said, it's better. It's better that I go away. Why is that? Because if he's in us, then we can serve like Martha and at the same time sit at the feet of Jesus. If he's in us, we can hold on like Rahab and still fall at the feet of Jesus just like uh, uh, Mary did. So it's better for us that Jesus goes away, but, but this, is the, this, is, this is where we have to activate our faith, right? We have to put our faith into action. And there is this, this connection, this relationship between faith and between hope that we have to be mindful of. When we engage our faith, hope is stirred up. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Peter had the truth, right? Where else are we gonna go? Only you have the words of eternal life, but guess what Peter had to do? He had to follow Jesus. Rahab had the promise, but what did Rahab have to do? She had to throw that scarlet cord out the window and hang on for dear life when everything else around her was falling. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. John Calvin said it like this, faith faith is the foundation upon which hope is built and hope then feeds our faith and keeps our faith alive. We access the promises of heaven by grace and through faith. We find hope by grace and through faith. But what, how do we apply that? How do we live that out day by day? This next story with Mary, I think, helps us understand what it means to live a life at the feet of Jesus, to truly find hope at the feet of Jesus. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I'll paraphrase it this morning. The good news is Lazarus is alive. He's sitting there at the table with Jesus. They're eating, having a good time. Martha, God bless her, she's serving away. Man, we need, we need Martha's. We need Martha's. She's serving away. Mary initially is not on the scene. She's not mentioned. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it seems she just barges in, right? There's not like the polite knock on the door there's not the like really soft opening like, hey, is this a good time? Come back later, is now, now's a good time? None of that. She just comes right on in. She doesn't care about the conversation. She doesn't care who's there, who's watching, who's listening. She has one thing, one thing that she wants to do. And she has in her possession a jar of oil, very rare, very expensive oil. It's called nard. I didn't name it. I'm just telling you what it was called. It's called nard. 
And she brings this expensive oil and she pours every last drop on the feet of Jesus. And just imagine the room at that point. Everybody at that point is like, just like that shocked silence, like what? And if that wasn't enough, what does she do next? Something very shameful in the ancient Near East. She unveils her hair. And that, at that point, people are starting to rumble. You, you can almost sense the, the, the mumbling and the grumbling in the background. What's she doing? What's she doing? What's going on here? But she doesn't stop there. It's not over yet. Then she lets down her hair and she washes the feet of Jesus with her hair. And at this point, the complaints become louder. In fact, Judas Iscariot actually speaks above the crowd and says, wait a minute, she wasted all of this. All of this could have been used for other things and we could have helped this person and we could have helped those people. And what does Jesus do? Jesus silences everybody. And he says, leave her alone. Leave her alone. And I want you to know this morning that this is, this is a demonstration. This is more than just a, a, a singular act of worship from Mary of Bethany. What's happening here is she's coming in to Jesus and pretty much all that she has, all that she possesses of, of any worth, of any value, she pours it out over the feet of Jesus and in humiliation lets down her hair and, and to further disgrace herself, she begins to wash his feet with her hair and she's saying, Jesus, in the good times, I sit at your feet and I listen to every word that you say. In the bad times, I run to you and I fall at your feet and I cry out to you. But Jesus, I want you to know I'm not just in this for the good times and I'm not just going to you in the bad times. I am in this for all times, whatever the season, whatever the circumstances, whatever the difficulty, whatever the hardships, whatever the naysayers and the religious and whatever anybody says, I don't care about the shame. I don't care about the humiliation. I don't care about the cost. Jesus, I give you everything. I give you everything. She poured out every drop of oil. She unveiled her hair without regard uh, to the shame. She let down her hair without giving ear to any of the naysayers. Judas begins to complain and Jesus says, leave her alone. You pour out your life, this is the connection. This is what it means for you and I. Like Mary, it's not just about, oh Jesus, I love you in the good times and I cry out to you in the bad times. No, Jesus, for all times I'm in, I give you everything. I give you everything. I pour out my life. I pour out my life. Just like Paul, it's an offering, I pour it out. And I believe with all my heart, you pour your life out like Mary poured out her costly oil. Jesus will speak those same words. Leave her alone to every demon, to every devil, every distraction, every deception, every destructive assignment against you and your loved ones. Jesus will say, leave her alone. Leave him alone. Their hope is in me. I'm an anchor for them. I hold them firm. I hold them secure. Where do you hope to find your hope this morning? Where do you hope to find your hope? What does it mean to find hope at the feet of Jesus? We pour our lives out. We live as an offering unto the Lord. And as we pour our lives out, the hope of heaven will fill us again and again and again. It doesn't leave us empty. It doesn't leave us dry. It doesn't leave us uh, with, with the sense of, I had it, but now I lost it. No, it's, it's a never ending supply. It's the hope of heaven. I just ask us, church, where else will we go? Where else will we turn? Who else, who else has the words of eternal life? What other cause is worthy of such an extravagant sacrifice? There is no one else. There is nowhere else. There is nothing else. So I ask you, what is, what is holding you back from pouring out your life? Is it the cost? Is it too costly? Are you worried about what others may think? Is it the sacrifice? Because what it means when the rubber meets the road, when we flee, 
the offerings of this world to grab a hold of the hope that is Jesus and Jesus alone. In the pursuit of Jesus, we have to let go of the things of this world. And that's the hard thing, isn't it? No longer are we looking to people to satisfy us. No longer are we expecting power or possessions or pleasure to meet that need. The author of Hebrews said of Moses that he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So to pour your life out for the sake of Christ, to live unashamed for the sake of Christ, to be disgraced for the sake of Christ is of greater value than any person, any power, any treasure, any pleasure this world can offer. The things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's Jesus only and it's Jesus always. He's gotta be more than just the Lord of the good times and the Lord of the bad times, the Lord of the mountaintops and the Lord of the valleys. He is that, but he's more than that. He's Lord of all times. He's Lord of all times. So whatever your season, whatever your situation, pour it out. We pour it all out. We don't leave a single drop. We don't worry what others may say. We don't worry what others may think. We don't worry about tomorrow. We choose that which is better. We don't get distracted by good things and miss out on the best thing. To sit at the feet of Jesus, to listen to him, to fall at his feet and cry out to him, to pour our life out as an offering unto him. When you sit at his feet, hope is found. When you fall at his feet, hope is found. When you pour out your life, hope is found. Hope that is an anchor. Hope that keeps you firm, keeps you secure. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. We stand to your feet this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we all got a little bit of Martha in us. And I pray in this moment right now that the Mary in us would Lead us and help us. That desire to be at the feet of Jesus, that hunger and thirst to hear his word. The wherewithal in difficult times to run to him, cry out to him, to pour our life out unto him. So I don't know where you're at in that spectrum. Maybe it's the good times and you, you've, you're not really necessarily engaged in anything bad, but the good things of life are distracting you from the better thing. Or maybe you're in a difficult time, a difficult season, and, and you've been looking and, and crying out to everything and everyone, and it's time to fall at his feet and cry out to him. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've just been stuck between two decisions. You know, on one hand, you wanna, you wanna be all in for Jesus, but on the other hand, it's really hard to let go of the things of this world. Wherever you're at, the altar is open. Will you come? Will you, can we take just a few minutes here and now to sit at his feet, to run to him, to cry out to him, to pour our lives out? The altars are open. We'll sing a song of worship. I'll come in just a moment and we'll pray. Find a place. Find a place. Sit with Jesus just for a moment. Let's worship.